This is the Beyond Barriers Unscripted Podcast. Try to find a gap that you know you can fill. Hello and welcome. My name is Randy Owen. And in this episode, we conclude our conversation with the folks over at Talk Description to Me. Now, Christine and JJ were kind enough back in early March to sit down for almost two hours and and have an unscripted conversation. So I'm really looking forward to uh, presenting this to you. But before we get to that, I'd like to ask if you enjoy the show to please consider subscribing. Hit the like, hit the like button and uh, and share with a friend. Uh, If you'd like to contact me, uh, drop a message, have any suggestions, questions or comments for the show. Uh, you can email me. My name is Randy Owen, and the email address here is bb.unscripted at gmail.com. And now, the conclusion of my conversation with Talk Description to Me. I, In my research, I discovered that you guys have a Facebook page, and I love the audio clips from Mars that you've, you've been posting um, but you've got some stuff on there about the, the Chandra X-ray Observatory. What's that all about? Ooh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory is so <laughs> exciting. Um, so I'll explain a bit about what it is. We're working with them, so that, that's why. Uh, oh, really? We are. It's very exciting. So what the Chandra X-ray Observatory is, they're making observations of deep space in fields that are not optical. So they're X-ray or or infrared. So when they get those images they're if you can call them images they're not visible in any way so what they typically do for the public is they convert them in into a visual image so it's taking data from the distant universe that's scientifically relevant and converting it into something that you can perceive with the naked eye and so Those are already, those are sort of artificial constructs. And on their website, they will give, this is an image of, you know, an artist's reconstruction of this phenomenon. And there's like a paragraph of extremely complex astronomical information that I personally have to read three times to to even, you know, start to understand because I'm not a scientist. But what it didn't do was tell you what the image actually looked like. And so reading their their science writing was pretty baffling for for a a science dilettante like me who sort of knows some things but is non-visual and so we approached them and said well what how can we work together on this and so what we're doing with them is taking a couple of images per month and jj is writing descriptions of the visual image or the the artist reconstruction and integrating that with the explanation that's being given. So what you end up with is a couple, a paragraph or two that makes way more sense if you're a non-visual learner. So the science is integrated with the description of the image itself. And so um, J- some audio describers in some contexts will re- uh, ask for consultants from the community to read through. And this is one case where JJ uh, does engage a consultant, me, um, to read through the <laughs> descriptions because it's so specific. This is a very particular kind yeah. of description and a very particular kind of writing. So we spent some time working out kind of the model of how to write this. It's different. Yeah. The, the, way, the writing style is different for this kind of stuff. So we we get a couple of images per month and JJ writes the description. I, I uh, you know, read through it and, and makes a, a suggestion or two, or sometimes they're just perfect. Then we submit them. So on the Chandra page, um, there are a hand, a, a steadily growing handful, which will be more than a handful pretty soon of, of image descriptions. And so what we're hoping is that this will they're going to revamp their web page so that the descriptions are a little easier, a little more congregated and easier to access all at once. Um, and my not very secret ambition is to get NASA more interested in offering description of the, their images, their space program, everything space and astronomy related, and to hire us to uh, 
<laughs> to, uh, to to make that happen. So if you know anyone at NASA uh, who's really keen on accessibility, <laughs> please have them contact us. We're ready and eager to talk. But the Chandra project, um, I sometimes I feel a bit bad because I don't think space is JJ's passion, and he's steeped uh, hip deep now in trying to explain <laughs> nebulae and black holes. And I just get excited when I get to read it, and like, and it's oh. pretty exciting to be able to have input in how it's communicated so if there's a paragraph that's unclear to me i get to ask questions or i get to say oh could we shorten that sentence or put some more pronouns in there or can we put a period right there and to make it more comprehensible easier to understand um it's super exciting i'm i'm very happy that it's going on and i'm really hoping it will lead to more uh more description for space and astronomy content and it really was this was a case of uh you know, getting an assignment, working with uh, with Chandra, they, they've been fantastic about providing images and all of the uh, contextual information that they have available at any given moment about an image. But to we tried at the beginning to just approach these images like we would for any museum or or, or cultural institution image description, and it just didn't work because the the elements are 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 too out there you know like when we i described this uh this images of of danny's i was able to say a mountain range you know trees in the foreground i didn't have to explain what a tree was everyone's got an understanding of what a tree looks like there are different kinds yada yada but it's a tree if i say so there's a you know there's a neutron star in the upper left it's like why what and and if i have to describe something that is 15 billion light years away like we're talking about things that we just don't have most of us don't have a frame of reference for and our brains can barely comprehend so approaching it like a straightforward art description it just it was a non-starter it just didn't go anywhere so christine and i really had to had to noodle around a bit and figure out like what's going to work how is what's the best approach and that's when we came up with this idea of integrating their their informational text with a description some basic storytelling like laying these images out in such a way that they unfold in a in a logical uh, sequence because that's something we can understand and then christine was very very wise in saying like listen we got to shorten all of these sentences we're we're throwing far too much information you cannot just like normally i i i lean pretty heavily on my ability to um narrate and so if i'm writing a sentence if i know i can you know i can add a little clause by changing my voice i'll do so in a in a, in a piece of written description but it just was not workable when you've got so many massive concepts to try and get into one descriptive description they need separate sentences you need a hard stop so that the listener can understand and mm-hmm. incorporate that and that is why it, this was a project for christine and i this was the two of us working on this together it was essential if if i if this had been describer alone it just would have fallen flat on its face this this needed um uh, collaboration not just uh not just simple consultation and and one of the, so, the fun part yeah. was that the way we like our in to to getting this gig was i i sort of knew someone who sort of knew someone and we were able to say when i sent her an introductory email i said and in case you're interested you know in episode whatever number we talked about spacex so if you want some context yeah. for what describing space or astronomy could be we already have this thing so we didn't have to go in cold and say here's what audio description is here's what it could do we could just say here's a link you know check it out listen to the five minutes yeah. she loved it she, she really loved it and i think that helped so the podcast is, is because we're filling this gap that existed uh it gives us a kind of a springboard to introduce description to people who might not be so familiar with it and then hopefully expand uh, the range of who who's offering description for what. The Chandra stuff's great, and I love to encourage anyone who's a, a space or astronomy geek that um, just ask NASA. Like, they they won't know how much the content is wanted unless they hear from people. And so if you want more space and astronomy content from NASA and audio description form, let them know, reach out to them on, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever your social media of choice is. Uh, and, and let them know that this is uh, content that people want more of. Absolutely. Uh, 
Christine, as you were talking, I used to have this. App, I still have it. It's called APOD, uh, Astronomical Picture of the Day. Have you heard of that? No, tell me. And so they, <laughs> JJ, are you familiar with it? No, I don't are know. Are you it thinking, either. oh boy, here's more work? <laughs> <laughs> when is the roller derby coming? Just when is the roller derby coming? <laughs> so there's an app, and it's called APOD. It's uh, for iPhone. And they publish every day. They have a picture from NASA or from JPL or, or wherever. And there's a, usually a really good description, and it's not over technical. Now, I don't know if it's because I go on about what a space geek I am, but JJ, what do you think? I think that at least one third of the email we get is from people who yeah. love space content and want more. Now I get it. I'm always enabling people by saying, I love the space. So, you know, <laughs> people are, are enabling me and I'm enabling them, but I really do. Don't you think JJ of our communications about one third are space fellow I, space geeks? Absolutely. Yeah. For space sci-fi. Uh, it, it does seem to be I mean, and who knows, maybe this is just the general population, uh, you know, as you say, feeling welcome to talk about it and ask about it. But uh, there does seem to be a, a, a particular interest within our listenership um, uh, for content that is about uh, about space and sci fi for sure. Interesting. When we were talking earlier, Christine, it came out that you do a lot of the editing and production work for Talk Description to me. Would you guys mind taking a few minutes and describe that process? Yeah, so in the division of work that we, we have on the podcast, JJ does the research and describing, then we record, and then I do the editing. So um, it's been a, a really good learning curve for me. Um, I'm learning I'm learning and using Reaper which is very accessible with NVDA. It's great. It's very powerful. It does a bajillion things. There's hotkeys. It's very good. Um definitely a learning curve though. So it, it's almost like each episode I refine some little little piece of of how to do that work. So there's two sides. There's the the technical aspects of producing clean good audio but then there's the thematic aspects where I have to take this gold and slice off parts and truncate parts and dissect things and try to fit it into uh you know an episode length that that makes sense and JJ and I have actually both gotten better at actually recording so that process has yeah. sort of refined itself because we d we know when not to ramble and I know what kinds of questions are likely to be fruitful and in the at the beginning I would sort of make observations and make connections and then I realized that that's not really relevant to what we're trying to do so we've both learned how to record better and then the in the editing process I've kind of learned how to focus on what fits the theme best and how to separate the little tidbits that I think are super interesting from what fits the theme best and what, what the, the listener is probably most interested in. So yeah, it's sort of two, two levels of skill refining the, the, the technical and then the thematic. Are you using any kind of control surface uh, for your editing or are you just doing everything with a corded keyboard? Yeah, no, just a just a QWERTY keyboard. Um, we we both re always record under identical conditions, so our audio is always as clean and reliable as it's going to get. So uh, I'm able to just work with the QWERTY keyboard. Would you say that there's almost a, an element of art to doing the editing and to keep it coherent? and yet meets the criteria that you need to meet. I, I think it's a bit flattering to, to think of it as an art for in my case, but I, it's definitely a skill. And the skill is to figure out what the overall theme of the episode is and the main ideas, because I have the kind of mind that just will go off in some crazy direction and ask a question that's completely tangential and interesting to me and maybe interesting to the listener too but you know when it comes to okay I want to get this episode down to x number of minutes what what can go and I think I'm getting better at figuring out more easily what's expendable if you could call any of, of our content expendable which I have a tough time <laughs> doing but I think the the skill of deciding what fits the theme of the episode or what makes a good shape to an episode my skill at that has gotten better yeah 
And there is a storytelling to the edit as well, you know, like uh, we talked about earlier how I, I mean, I often say like, oh, I, I know I'm repeating myself because I'll, I will try and come at an image from three or four different points of view and would do three or four different techniques to see what's going to land. And so sometimes Christine then takes one of those or two of those instead of the five that I've laid out for. Her. So, you know, she, Christine might not want to say there's artistry to it, but I will. I'll say her editing, you know, is a storytelling art. You have to, the episodes do have to have a, a, an arc to them, even if it's just within, you know, one topic and then another topic. There are many arcs and, you know, hopefully our conversation has some of that naturally built in. And when it doesn't, the editing has to compensate. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, we're getting better, as she said, at the at the recording side and definitely Christine's, uh, you know, episode by episode, uh, you know, upping her artistry of the uh, in the editing process as well. It's funny because we uh, we had a recent episode on Wonders of the World and um, I looked at the overall length of the recording, went, oh, my gosh, this is going to be so difficult. And, you know, J.J., <laughs> As I said, JJ will sometimes accuse himself of repeating himself. But as I listened through, I realized, you know what, Chris, you were not paying attention because you asked him a question that he'd already answered, and so. <laughs> uh huh. That that oh, is real talk oh, okay, right there. Okay, I'm hearing some identifying here. <laughs> that is um, real talk. I, thank you. I'm not the only one that does that. <laughs> because when you're recording, you're multitasking. Like my brain yeah. is thinking about yeah. the the, yeah. the noise in the background, and am yeah. I did I just creak the floor, and how am and I going to edit this? So taking notes at the time, yeah. Taking notes at the time, so yeah. it, I noticed it particularly in the Natural Wonders episode. I was like, "Holy crap, Chris! He just answered that. Why are you asking that again?" And making him <laughs> making him repeat himself, which he's ready to accuse himself of anyway. So in that edit, it was actually a lot easier than I thought it would be because I realized, okay, you just asked this question again he had to repeat that whole segment you can just chop that whole block right out <laughs> gone and so it, i'm realizing that sometimes it's me that i'm just not attentive or i'm too i'm multitasking unsuccessfully and so uh that was a really useful thing for me to focus on in, in that episode specifically is there a target time that you shoot for and then do you have a regular release date schedule um, we do have a regular release date. We uh, release on Saturday mornings. We aim for f no more than 40 minutes, unless it's something really intense that just every word is necessary. Um, then we, you know, sometimes our episodes will be a bit longer if the content is so serious or compelling that we don't, yeah, we don't want to uh, edit out anything. Um, but our release is always Saturday mornings. We do have breaking episodes as well, though, like sometimes when if something happens that like we got to talk, we can't wait until the weekend to talk about this. It's it's current now. This is this matters to today. Um, and in those moments, we do our best to uh, to produce and, and post within 24 hours, which can be challenging. You know, we both we already have day gigs right and we've got uh, we, and we have to wait for the for the visual information to be available so it, it it's it's hard to be much tighter than 24 hours on that stuff can you talk about work life balance yeah <laughs> Sure, yeah. I can talk about that. I'm big on the work-life <laughs> balance. I, I think it's super important. And I'm, I focus on the life, if you know what I mean. So um, I I had a funny realization the other day that if... Um, so I do some... Con I, everything I do is pretty much contract work or freelance. And um, I realized if one of the contractors came to me and said, we'd like to hire you full-time, I would say, no thanks, because I love <laughs> variety in my workday. And when I'm on I'm really on so the work I do is very very focused so you know it might be moderating a panel discussion for 90 minutes after which I'm you know limp and shaking because that's very intense work um you know recording or editing the podcast um yeah everything I do are, are very intense talky conversational things so do I work eight hours a day probably not but everyone thinks I'm really, really busy because I, I put out a lot of content and my name shows up here and there and there and here. And I'm perfectly good to, to give that impression because I do work hard, but I definitely don't 
you know, spend eight hours of my day doing that. And that's exactly the way I want it. That suits me as a person <laughs> very well. And I've seen people who put eight or 10 hours in in a day, but they're jerking around, they're taking their time, they're not really focused, they're stretching, they're chatting with the people at the water cooler. And that's just not me. You know, what everyone's different. Everyone, it's totally fine to, yeah. to, figure out what your patterns are and my patterns are definitely that I like to work intensely uh for a shorter amount of time which gives me blocks in the day where I can you know do exercise or go outside or do whatever or lie down whatever things I want to do I'm all about the work-life balance especially with the focus on the life <laughs> yeah I I have to say I I found it a little more challenging uh, as a lot of us have uh, in this pandemic world and in a lockdown world. And it's funny, it's in part because of the podcast um, and in part because of the number of different gigs I have in different in different spheres right now. In the podcast, it's in the best way. Like uh, when we're getting, when we're uh, being in touch with our listeners and talking to people, it, that's on social media and a lot of that's in the evenings and a lot of that's in the weekends. And, you know, we release on the weekend and that's when a lot of conversations then happen. Like, oh, you just released this episode. I want to talk about this. And I'm like, that's fantastic. But it's my Saturday. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because it's the best part of my job, but unfortunately doesn't happen on the, you know, nine to five weekdays. And the other thing with 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 accessibility and, and audio description is for me, it's my it's my full time nine to five. But for a lot of people, getting something described is kind of done off the side of their desk. You know, like, yes, it's kind of my job at this museum to get this described, but it's not how I spend my days. So I got to get it described. But it's like the last thing I do in the day or, geez, I've got to catch up on that this weekend. And so I receive a lot of correspondence from colleagues at different institutions after hours and on the weekends and a lot of us are doing this our desks are in our bedrooms and so uh, I am certainly someone who is finding right now that I'm getting a lot of this correspondence in the evenings I can't possibly if if I answer all of these things in in the moment that they get sent to me I have zero time off off and you know I'm I'm with Christine on this one being off is is essential I, I just can't do it some people are kind of on all the time and I I'm not I need to turn off and so I know I have become and, and Christine you know can attest to this I've become someone who's not always reliable at replying because I'm like I gotta I have to not reply for the next 12 hours and I'll do it tomorrow and, and I will but but not today and it's a it's it's a challenge. It's it definitely is for sure. I would definitely say as much as I just said, I never want to have a nine, you know, but the truth is there's never a day where I don't do something work related seven days a week. And it may only be, you know, half an hour, but there is a way in which I definitely miss having two solid days where I don't look at anything yeah. work related that never, ever happens. And it's, it's, it's fine because I love all of the work that I do, but, uh, yeah, vacation as an actual vacation where you don't do any work stuff. I really don't remember the yeah. last time that that happened for me. And I'm I'm not complaining. I'm truly not because I do love my work and I'm grateful to have it. And yeah, I wonder absolutely. what's it like to actually switch off the work part of yourself for two days or even five days. Like what a ra that's a radical <laughs> idea to me at this point. <laughs> Yeah, I, my my wife was uh, uh, telling me a story the other day. She was speaking to a, a younger colleague uh, who didn't have kids, uh, had a was a more junior level position, so didn't have a lot of carryover work. Uh, you know, work is done during the work hours, and then you then you're done. And so she was talking to this colleague, and she was like, "Oh, the colleague said, oh, you know what? I it's Friday afternoon. I have literally nothing planned." until I have to return to work on Monday. Nothing. Not an appointment all weekend. I don't have to do my laundry. There's nothing that I have to do for the next 48 hours. And my wife was like jaw dropped. Like, how can you have 40? <laughs> I don't get it. Nothing? You've got nothing? It, just, it's, it was incomprehensible to have no commitments to anything or anyone for 48 hours. 
and she was almost offended by the notion. Like, how dare you have Jealous nothing? Jealous might be more close you some to of the my tasks. there rather yeah, than offend. I but. think it very much. But I definitely feel that sometimes. Like, off is off. Like, I gotta, I, I, I put down my phone and walk away, and and then I'm the jerk who didn't reply. You know, because <laughs> there's always something coming in. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough, and especially in and, and part of the thing that because of this podcast. We're always looking. What's the next topic? What's happening in the world? What's the interesting visual? So I'll go for a walk, and this happens sometimes. I'll be going for a walk, and I'll start sending Christine texts like, oh, what about city infrastructure? <laughs> like, have we talked about power, like hydro houses? Or have we talked about, like, the paint markings on the street before from, you know, from the electric company? Do you know about this? Is this a thing? And it's like, oh, my God, dude, go for a walk. <laughs> like, just... Stop. Just go for a walk. <laughs> There's a funny corollary for me, which is that for many, I would say 10 years maybe, I had my head in the sand on purpose around the news. I had really strict boundaries around what I would read because, you know, if it was something I could act, this is my criteria, if it's something I can act on, then I want to know about it that I think is important. So I had causes or issues that I'd follow, but the news in general, uh-uh. And, um... That was a choice that I was very comfortable with. And now uh, that's not on. So partly that's pandemic related, but it's also yeah. professional that, um, oh, what? I don't even remember as terrible what the issue was, but there was something very intense going on and I was trying not to think about it. And I was thinking, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then JJ texted me and said, we're going to cover this, right? <laughs> And I, I said, yeah, I know. I was just waiting for the text. And he said, yeah, Lois was looking at me and saying, you're going to cover this, right? <laughs> so we yeah, both totally. went, yes, yes, we yeah, are. Both of us had been like oh, quietly like, oh, someone's going to mention waiting. this to us. Someone's yeah, going to Yeah, just ask waiting for the other one to, to do the right thing yeah. and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to cover this, this yeah, we'll painful cover issue, yeah. right? And so the news is, is a, I have a funny relationship with it where I used to be very good at compartmentalizing things that were difficult because I knew I couldn't affect them uh and now you know we're we're quasi journalists and so that that level of <laughs> imperviousness is no longer part of my life you both appear to me to be innovators uh highly motivated genuine um task oriented and human beings that are not afraid to make adjustments and 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 value relationships looking back at maybe at your childhood or you know earlier in life was there somebody or was there something that happened that instilled in you the values that you have to do what you do does that make sense first of all can you write yeah. that down for my cv for my resume that would be awesome <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, I, we have nice. it recorded <laughs> sweet i'm making a transcript right there right there for me it was my mom for sure she uh definitely she made sacrifices and did a lot of things so that I had opportunities as a blind kid to do all of the things that my sighted peers were doing and to, to stay at home and not be sent away to school and go to the same school as my brothers and sisters and um so she always definitely encouraged me to do that and then you grow up with a certain sense of obligation to live up to that um mm -hmm. which um is good. It made me, you know, interested in achieving things. And my, she was a very curious person, just like me. So she was always reading and learning things. And she was my go to when I didn't understand, like, why do people fight wars? You know, these naive little kid questions, and she would have an answer. And so I would say that and, and she was wise and kind as well. So I would say all of those uh, lovely qualities, which um, that's very nicely put. And I definitely don't feel like I live up to those. But thank you. And and I also just want to add, we're really fun at parties, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would concur. I don't know if I can. uh, uh, uh necessarily agree with uh, your very generous assessment of, of us but yeah I mean I, they were I remember when I was a, a young parent my kids are uh, teens and almost teens now and uh, when I was a young parent there were a handful of families that we would watch and and 
not just because of the way they parented, but because of the way they approached the world. And, you know, we had kid, little kids and the world was seeming very overwhelming to us. How to deal with them, how to, how to deal with, uh, walking around in the world with these little beings that you were supposed to be responsible for and watching a handful of these families that had different approaches and yet managed to be calm and patient individuals who were still themselves, not just parents. And it, I, I recognize that this answer is coming across as, as, as strictly one of, uh, of a parenting focus, but it wasn't just about that. It was watching these people who were learning from that experience and, and moving through the world with, uh, with, with calm, with confidence, with, with empathy. And, uh, and, I, I remember thinking a lot about what they were doing and how I could how I could be the same. Like what, you know, what fountain are they drinking from? Because I want to go there. You know, uh, yeah, thinking a lot about that. How to move through the world. I, I like I like watching people move through the world, uh, and 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 trying to 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 steal a step or two from them if I can. There's been an explosion of content creation in the blind community specifically over the last year. I remember when I started my podcast, I had heard something like they said, every hour YouTube has 30 hours of, or every minute there's 30 hours of content uploaded to YouTube. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. But they said there's fewer than 1 million podcasters worldwide. Now this was last spring, I believe. Where do you see the future of podcasting? I, I think there's a really great opportunity here i i think it's got a, a bright future and i i've been thinking about this in the context of clubhouse because um with i think there's a bit of a pandemic connection where being in the real world was something we all understood then being on a zoom call where people can see inside your house is a different reality that we slowly got used to and then I think the the video aspect of that started getting so fatiguing that uh, the sighted world began to experience audio maybe in some of the same ways that the blind people do as a window on the world but they could liberate themselves and they could just sit there in their day pajamas and it didn't matter if their hair was looked like crap or whatever and their apartment was a mess and so I feel like there's a, a new appreciation for strictly audio venues and podcasting even you know in the sighted world has be, been growing steadily and so i think the pandemic has has um accelerated that so that and it's something you can listen to while you're driving or while you're doing a, a task that requires you to be looking at at something else so i i think that i think the future is bright yeah for sure and for description stuff specifically i think Podcasting is a perfect venue for it because, you know, podcasts are relatively inexpensive to put out and y you don't have to attach a podcast to an existing piece of art. You can talk description. You can you can add it to anything. You can uh, describe all kinds of, uh, of elements of the world. And so uh, I think podcasting and description are a, 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 an absolutely perfect pairing and uh you know you're right there was a, a real boom in ex in um in the number of podcasts in general but uh in this space in particular uh i mean at, at least a half dozen podcasts that had some take on audio description were uh, you know launched within months of of us you know some before some after we're definitely part of a cohort um and uh, and it's been really nice because folks have been sharing, you know, folks have been really generous about um, uh, promoting other people's content and having having people's guests on shows and and joining conversations online and making sure that our audiences are all aware of each other, because there's some there's some fantastic content out there. It's, it's just a perfect medium for uh, uh, for blind and low vision uh, description users, for sure. I think, you know, there was a time when everybody kind of approached things as we're in competition, and now there's this collaboration. You know, I, I promote your guys' show all the time. There's a few other blind abilities and, and a few other uh, podcasts yeah. that I really like. Um, so I, I, I kind of see 
a general attitude shift and change into, you know, we're truly in a worldwide community and we have an incredible amount of power at our fingertips. You know, when I was a kid, if you were on television, that took, you know, a million dollar studio. Yeah. And today in exactly. real time, you can be on your iPhone with an internet connection and talking to somebody clear across the planet. You can even translate through Facebook and through Google. It's, it's uh, all true. It's and I think a, another part of that is it's up to the, the game for originality because mm -hmm. there is so much choice. So that's another interesting consequence. And, and you know, when I first got into this, being a member of the, the blind and low vision community, um, TikTok, Instagram, how does a blind person use that? And then a friend of mine, is she turned me on to the blind woodsman who's on TikTok. Have you guys heard of him? No. No, the blind woodsman? The no. blind woodsman. So he, he's blind, uh, and he, he's got a huge following on TikTok, and he's a... Uh, he has like a, uh, a woodworking shop. So he does a lot of stuff on a lathe and he just creates all this art and yeah. bowls and, and just, it's really cool. And he's just got a huge, huge following. And the reason why I point this out is that because TikTok is such a visual platform, you know, you start thinking, well, and, I, and I've seen conversations on Facebook about this. Well, how does a blind person use Instagram and, and you know, and, and Facebook and it's, you know, my friends, I will go check this out. So it's, um, yeah, yeah. Hey, the time has come for my brilliant scheme. I always thought that I wanted, you know, my. of course I stopped when I thought, how do I monetize this? And I couldn't come up with an answer. But like <laughs> my, my idea was a YouTube channel called Blind Woman with a Knife because I'm pretty good with kitchen skills and I can dice an onion really fast. So I thought, wouldn't that be a great like rubbernecking thing? Like here's this blind lady. You should watch her dice a tomato. It's pretty amazing. So TikTok, that's the venue. I could just do a vegetable that's a day. That's the venue for it. That would be totally. perfect for TikTok. Exactly. And you're, and you're like tapping into this to the whole thing. It's like the, the real reason we all go to the Tiger Show at the in Las Vegas or at a circus is because we're kind of wondering, is this the time? Is this the moment that bet. the tiger is going to attack? But is this like, where she you know, you're working with a knife. It's like, all, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're watching you. We're like, wow, she's really good. But is this the moment? Is this the TikTok video until people are going to keep watching every day? They're going to watch every episode. Can I monetize this? This is wondering what I need to know. That's the key. Yeah, You got your, your nice, your ad scrolling along the bottom brought sure. to you by, I don't know what, the Swiss Army Knife Company. Sure, or, uh, sure. You know, yeah, Get a yeah. knife sponsor. Brought to you by Johnson & Johnson and Band-Aid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brutal. Oh well my done. God. Well You're really done. taking it up there. Well I love done. it. <laughs> oh. No, I, I, when I went through uh, living skills training, one of the hardest things I had to do, and of course, uh, was cut a steak that I cooked. Now, I leave out the point that I overcooked the steak and that I had a really, really dull knife. But um, Oh, dull <laughs> knives are terrible. No way, man. They're terrible. They, they are. They, they really are. Um, you guys produce something that I think is really meaningful. It's got great quality. Uh it's something that I actually look forward to hearing, you know, what, what, now that I know you guys are on Saturday morning, I've actually listened to you guys since the beginning. <laughs> Yay! I, oh, I haven't great. finished. Oh, awesome. I haven't finished the three wonders of the world. I heard the part about Taj Mahal. Uh -huh. and, but what's the, <laughs> what's the last you guys have Taj Mahal in there and uh, Niagara Falls. And the Angkor yeah. Wat, the temple at Angkor Wat. It's an Angkor yeah, Wat. Angkor Wat. Angkor and that's in Ethiopia, Wat. right? Cambodia. Oh, uh, Cambodia. Okay. Cambodia. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, I'll be going back to that after I get off of here. <laughs> um, so what advice would you have for an upcoming uh, content creator? What are, you know, if you had to give three rules, three to five rules to create content and to build an audience and be meaningful and, re and relevant. Hmm. Wow. Okay, three to five, that's pretty demanding, JJ. We got to break this up. So I'll give one, <laughs> okay. then you give one. Okay, so given sure, the criteria you said, I would say try to find a gap that you know you can fill. Okay, JJ? Yeah. Uh, uh, the first one is start. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, like... Yeah, the, I should have started. So your many people are like, uh, like, oh, man, like, oh, I've got an idea, I've got an idea, I want to do this thing, and I am so guilty of this. Uh, and then you don't do it, and... Uh, you know, yeah, my first rule would be start. Yeah. Then I would say 
make yourself part of the community that you want to engage with because if you're just some yeah do that do that you know uh uh then you're going to have less engagement but if you make yourself part of the community that you want to reach people will have a sense of who you are and that you're a groovy person and maybe they should care more about what you're what you're doing just to follow up on that yeah. christine since you guys have been more active on facebook have you noticed a difference We certainly, with our uh, with our Facebook and being on Twitter, um, we we definitely get more uh, um, more requests because of those conversations, and okay. I think we have a better sense of what people are uh, of what people are interested in because we're because it's not just about us and our thoughts. So I I think definitely for sure. Yeah, you're making yourself part of okay. a conversation versus here I am and I'm going to tell you what I think is really cool. Tell you, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, I got one more, okay. um, which would be I'm not a I'm not a huge gear guy. I don't believe, especially with podcasting, it really doesn't take a, a massive amount of equipment and gear. Um, but I would say if you're going to put out audio – be aware of how it sounds. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a ridiculous uh, uh, thing to have to say, but I think a lot of people, uh, not a lot, but some people are get excited and don't remember that, that this has to sound pleasing in some way. It doesn't, that doesn't mean that everyone has to have a radio voice. It doesn't mean that um, it has to be recorded in studio, but whatever it is you put out, remember that this is an audio medium. And so therefore it should sound pleasing and listen to other people's work in the kind of genre that you yeah. want to be in because that'll help you learn what you like and what you hate and what you never want to sound like or what you'd like to aspire to sound like awesome thank you i will uh make sure i follow all those rules my, my big struggle right <laughs> now is um is I've got three episodes recorded and I haven't been able to finish the editing because of school and work. Yeah. Editing yeah. is yeah. very time consuming. It's yeah. very time consuming. Yeah. And you can't, it's not like, oh, I've got 10 minutes, I'll sit and do some editing. No, no, no. You got to no. have like no. an hour at yeah, least right. to really yeah. focus on it. So it's. And then um, you get through it and you've heard it so many times and you're like, wait a minute, did we already talk about this? So I have to step back and then come back to it. And yeah. It's for sure. You got to yeah, walk away sure. and come back and listen to the mm -hmm. whole thing. Uh, as a piece over again so jj mm -hmm. how has your life changed or has it been affected by working in the blind and low vision community oh yeah it absolutely has and you know i i've been working in the community longer than i've been engaged with the community and the, the real shift for me was when I went from being someone who just described for movies and television pre-social media when I didn't have a, I didn't have ways to communicate with anybody and then started doing the live stuff and then started working on this podcast and engaging in Facebook groups and joining a Joel, a, a goal ball uh, group and playing goal ball. And like it, it as it's uh, it's been so warm and welcoming and I mean obviously professionally it has made me a, a better describer but that's a real aside uh, the the friendships that I have made and the and the um, perspective that it has given me uh, I just I am I, I feel blessed to have been uh, welcomed into uh, Toronto in, in particular, Toronto's various blind and low vision communities, uh, some just lovely people uh, who I am always happy to hang out with and frankly cannot wait to do another live walking tour. Um, you know, there are always some familiar people on those tours and then there are always some new folks. And, you know, the feeling of wrapping up that that ghost walk, the described ghost walk tour and heading to the bar afterwards and all of us sitting around the table and telling our own ghost stories. And, oh man, I miss that You're so much. Me. I really do. You're so this is like the third time, second or third time you've mentioned a ghost walk. And I meant to ask you earlier, please, <laughs> please, please. What's the ghost walk about? What is this? What is this oh, ghost walk you're talking it was, about? So that was a fun one. So I'd been doing these tours, uh, these walking tours and, uh, 
and I've always, you know, I'm, I, li- I like to think of myself as a storyteller. I tell stories to my kids and it's kind of part of my work life. So I kind of always had dreamed about being the guy who leads a ghost walk. You know, you, you, you go to London, England and you, there are signs for ghost walks. And I'm, oh, I'd love to lead a ghost story tour. And so I, I brought this idea to the group I was working with. I said, what if what if I lead a ghost walk of Toronto where I take the the ghost stories from all of these haunted buildings in old Toronto, but I ramp them up with audio description. So I really lean in heavy on the description side. I pull in sonification and audio elements, and I bring in tactile elements when possible. And and what if I just take these ghost stories and tailor them for a blind and low vision audience? And the group I was working with, they were super keen. They're like, go for it. They just had, they had, uh, I had earned a bit of, uh, 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 I guess they, they were good enough to allow me to do that. And, and so I, I wrote up this tour and it was fun. It was fun. Like we got to tell some stories and walk through the city as a group and feeling the old stone walls of these, you know, 200 year old Gothic buildings and, you know, pulling pulling aside you know dry vine leaves so we could find gargoyles that were part of the stories we were telling i actually there was one story that was about toronto's last hanging and so i actually made a noose i found like a big thick piece of hemp rope and i made a noose so that i could pass it around while telling the story of the last hanging it was a riot i loved it it was such a it good was time spectacular i was there and this is a cliche but every single word is true i literally i laughed i cried i got chills down my spine it was all that it was really really good so what's next for talk description to me Ooh, hmm. uh Let's see. Our episode this week is on micrography, which is what things look like under a microscope. And I'm going to tell you right now, some of it, the yuck factor is pretty high. And then um, (laughs) we're doing an episode on the moon, which I'm really excited about. And JJ's actually excited, too, which is even more exciting. So because it's sort of astronomy, but there's there's lots to talk about. So and were we going to do something on spring? Oh, spring. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, spring. Yeah, the look of spring. Um, yeah and then so much depends on what happens in the world like that's what we've got planned but uh if if something jumps jumps up between you know now and when we record then all bets are off and those those ideas go to the side you know i want to thank you both very much for taking the time out of your day uh you truly have inspired me and, and and many many other people i think what you do is very very valuable it's very genuine and it's really nice to see the communities brought together you know the blind the low vision and the fully sighted and and in this the way you present it i don't feel different i just feel like i'm part of i'm pressing my hand to my heart that's really beautiful thank that's, you yeah, that's lovely randy it's thank been a you fabulous it's conversation. A, yeah absolutely uh, it's a, you know, thanks for hosting us, man. It's, this has been lovely. Yeah, I feel like I've been on the psychiatrist couch, but in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very comfy yeah, couch. Yeah, it's very comfy. <laughs> <laughs>